Okay, um, thank you for the opportunity to um, give a talk. So this is a work I did as part of my postdoc um, with collaborators from New York and also Aussie in France. And our work was recently published in Ocean Modeling. So if you want to, for, if you want further details, I mean, that's it. But yeah, so I titled my talk, uh, Is There Any Hope in Mesoscale ID Transport Tensor and Parametrizing Oceanic uh, Subgrid Eddy Dynamics? Um, perhaps none of this jargon makes sense to you, but if you're familiar with the literature of eddy parameterization, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut some details on the math. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, that's just a head up that the math in this talk is not very rigorous, but yeah, I'll try to explain through all the terminology that I use here. Use here. So just to start off with some eye candy, um, this is more or less the state of the art of ocean simulations. I mean, we all know high, uh, co ops ha has their own high com configuration of these super high resolution simulations. But this one was done by colleagues in France using the NEMO uh, model. So it's the simulation of the North Atlantic, which may be obvious to everyone here. Uh, we see a nice sharp Gulf Stream separation, and the separated Gulf Stream um, um, heads northwards. Uh, where the North Atlantic current is supposed to be. The resolution is 160 um, or on the order of one kilometer resolution and with tides. So the pulsing you see in the current speed magnitude is the tide. Um, but, um, but yeah, when you go to like climate or even, even ocean only, but basin or global scale simulations, of course, we cannot afford such high model resolution. And uh, if we just focus on the separate Gulf Stream region that I have in the box here. Um, so what I'm finding here is just the SST from the raw output of the high res simulation. And then on the middle panel, I just show what that, what, what that is when it's coarsed into one text. So this is a more or less like sort of schematic understanding of what the ocean, what ocean models can only represent when the um, model resolution is on the order of one tenth, which is rough, which is what usually the model resolution reduces to when we do global ocean simulations. Yeah. When you course it, do you subsample or you average? Or... I course grain. So like boxcar average to boxcar average. And like on the on your sorry on your right panel, um, I just show the difference uh, between the unfiltered and coarse grain. So we miss all these sharp filaments basically, and. Uh, as a result, the atmosphere also doesn't see these sharp fronts. So there's an effect on your sea fluxes as well. Um, so just to recap on like uh, what happens when we only have limited model resolution, uh, this is a figure taken from Justin and Shu 2017. So yeah, the effective resolution of global ocean simulations on the order of one tenth. Um, what I'm showing you is a result from a one twelfth run. In the lack of uh, and then the paper shows um, a sweep of model resolution runs that goes from 112th, 125th to 150th. Uh, this is showing eddy kinetic energy at the surface. And then on the left top is the estimate from satellite observations. So yeah, at, at the model, when the model resolution is limited, um, if you look at the Gulf Stream separation, the 112 uh, notably has an overshoot northwards where the Gulf Stream separates. And then there's also a lack of um, eastward extension into the gyre of the separated Gulf Stream. And another point is that uh, the North Atlantic current tends to be much, much weaker when the model resolution is limited. And um, you might ask, well, why is this? I mean, we'll, what's causing the lack of eddy kinetic energy and let's say quote unquote wrong separation of Gulf Stream and perhaps more fundamentally, why do we even care? So starting from why we care, uh, like putting in the Gulf Stream in the perspective of global circulation, uh, the Gulf Stream um, consists of the up, upper limb of the global oceanic heat transport. Um, so, you know, what I'm showing you on your right and left is like the global um, overturning circulation and the, yeah, the Gulf Stream basically transports heat northwards 
it gets which gets subducted into the abyss and flows southward again. Mm -hmm. But my point here is, well, yeah, the Gulf Stream is an crucial part of the global ocean circulation. And when you talk about air-sea interaction, there's this recent schematic by Chesty 2021, where the Gulf Stream and Croatia both jointly or sync. She uses the word synchron. In, in, they jointly affect in a synchronous manner to affect the westerly jets and hence uh, the track of the, the, the storm tracks, basically. So um, just based on these two examples, what I'm trying to say is that the positioning and eastward extension of the oceanic jets, which the Gulf Stream is one of the examples matter. And that's why we want to improve our representation of the Gulf Stream in our ocean models. So in order to understand the first question, why, uh, which I noted why we see a poor representation of the Gulf Stream when the model resolution is um, limited. We need to understand how eddies work basically in an energetic way. So if we were to like focus on like one, like for example, if we were to focus on like an eddy here, I mean, if that's just one example. It could be one second. Oh yeah, so if we were to focus on an eddy, for example, here, that's like the horizontal view of it. But if we look at it vertically, this eddies tend to look like this. You see a bulging in the ice, like a vertical bulging in the isothermal. So this is just temperature. Um, so you see this hot blob and that's a warm core eddy basically. And this is plotted in the vertical. So this is an observation of an eddy and uh, yeah, because they tend to bulge the isothermals, they result in an increase in potential energy. And uh, well, as I guess Earth systems work, they tend to not like an excess of potential energy. So eddies try to convert this potential energy into kinetic energy. And my, and the point here is that when the ocean, uh, ocean when the model resolution is coarse the model lacks this process of conversion of excess potential energy to kinetic energy. And hence we have less energetic ocean currents. So there has been like decades of work on how to improve this via eddy parameterizations. And the most common two parameterizations that we have is the Jet McWilliam and uh, like uh, parameterization and isopignal tracer or ready parameterization. And um, the, Font blue and red mean something here in the schematic. So um, what I'm showing you here in the schematic is the blue line is like the isopycnal, and I have a bulging here in the isopycnal. And these are well um, hot contours of density surfaces or buoyancy surfaces, however you want to put it. And in the red wiggly arrows, I tried to express like the eddy transport of passive tracers. So um, the Jan McWilliam parameterization basically takes care of flattening out this bulging and ice signal to the right. So it gets, gets rid of this excess potential energy. And what the ready parameterization does is it parameterizes, parameterizes the um, eddy flux of tracers within each isopignal layer. Uh, and mathematically how this is formulated is um, so the mean, um, so the, there's a perturbation in the isopycnal or contour of buoyancy. And then Jet McLean's tries to find it out to a mean position, which I write as B bar, like the mean position of the buoyancy contour. And it's usually parameterized as eddy flux of buoyancy um, related to the gradient of the mean, uh, the gradient of the mean buoyancy yeah. field through this APA GM coefficient. And uh, the ready transport does the same thing, but for tracers. Like when I say tracers, it can be um, like nutrients, phytoplankton, so forth. And this uh, is in the same formula, but just takes a different coefficient value called APA ready. Sir? Yeah. The, the way this is implemented differs between. Yeah, yeah, numerical models. Yes. And models. Yeah, yeah, N numerical details differ. But yeah, that's what I meant by I'm cutting details on the math. Yeah. Um, so this is this looks nice 
all nice and dandy. So like, what's the problem here? Uh, well, the problem is rather pretty big. So, well, the mathematic, like, like mathematically it's all fine and dandy, but the question becomes, what are the values of those Kafka GMs and Kafka Ready? We don't really have a good estimate for this. And with the lack of a better constraint, what people op often do operationally is they just set Kappa GM equals Kappa Ready. Um, and well, there's no physical um, reasoning to do this. It's just that we don't have a better es like estimate to do this. And also, if you remember the schematic, uh, so GM basically tries to flatten out the isopycnol to a hump to the basically its mean isopycnol state, but um, it only accounts for the loss of potential energy. And in the real world, this potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, but GM does not take part of this convergent process. And for me, at least, it, more fundamentally, the question is what is an quote unquote eddy in a soup of ocean currents? So what I mean by this is this is a numerical simulation done by people in Quetz in France. Um, so this is, well, this is just a snapshot of the relative vorticity. And when, when people talk about eddies, you can start questioning, well, maybe this ring, like a mesoscale eddy, well, is an eddy? And you have these smaller scale like, uh, eddies that people call some mesoscale eddies. But then you have this meandering of the Gulf Stream itself and is the meander an eddy and so forth. So it becomes, um, well, it, it's a philosophical question, but like, how do you actually define an eddy when all of these, like, different, all these physical phenomena of different time scale and also spatial scales come together? So, what I how I define an eddy is um, using ensemble simulations, at least in this study. So, um, I use an uh, eddying 112th numerical simulation of the North Atlantic. You see the Gulf Stream shooting off from the east coast of the US and the, the domain bathymetry may seem a bit weird, but because we're only focusing on the North Atlantic, the domain is configured to zone, wrap around zone only, meaning so Europe, like Spain is here basically. Uh, it's just to say, you know, um, memory allocation on HPC, but yeah, it covers the whole North Atlantic ocean domain. And then when I say ensemble simulations, um, one thing to realize about the Earth system is that it's chaotic, meaning that um, it's the, the, the realized state of any given day is very, is very, very sensitive to initial condition uncertainty. So um, in, in nomenclature, people call this butterfly effect. So I just have my flaky butterfly here, and then boom, we have an ensemble of simulations. So this is, this is the representation of the North Atlantic Ocean on, on any given day. And these are equally probable representation of the Gulf Stream for that day. And what I'm showing you here is basically um, January 1st, 1967 of the yeah, like ensemble representation. And uh, one can split this ensemble simulation into the ensemble mean and residual to the ensemble mean. And the interpretation of this with some caveat is the ensemble mean can be interpreted as the ocean's response to the prescribed common atmosphere, meaning that all of these ocean simulations only vary by a small perturbation in their initial condition, but the atmosphere they see are all the same. And the eddies are interpreted uh, uh, henceforth as uh, expression of oceanic chaos. So yeah, that's my definition of eddies. And using this ensemble simulation, we can start trying to figure out what this, you know, ed, ed, like kappa GM coefficient is. So what I'm showing you here is the same equation that I showed you before for the ready parameterization. But instead of like directly diagnosing this scalar coefficient, um, which has been argued quite thoroughly that it's, it is a poor representation to use a scalar eddy diffusivity for anisotropic flow. Um, we extend this framework to a tensor framework where, um, well, now this tensor K has four parameters in it, which these are now the new um, eddy transport coefficients. So one can use this framework. So, I mean, from the ensemble simulation, one can diagnose the eddy flux and also the gradient of the ensemble mean tracer field. 
and then try to get an estimate for K or the uh, eddy transport tensor by well, basically linear al algebra. And um, in this study, I, I used two ensembles, two sets of ensemble simulations. So this one is what I showed earlier, a realistic North Atlantic, North Atlantic ensemble simulation, which has 24 members. And then I also have another idealized quasi-geostrophic double gyre ensemble, which has 101 members. And uh, the colors here for the idealized run is just the string function, meaning uh, the blue is the subpolar gyre and the red is the subtropical gyre. And uh, yeah, so I use this ensemble simulations. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. Or maybe it's not the time to really go in too much details, but you you, you don't you do you rotate the tensor in your one twelfth degree already for tracers? Oh, so I well, so that yeah, that's another detail I was going to omit, but I analyze everything in isotechnal coordinates. But the the test uh, your simulation itself rotates the tensor. Do you diffuse along isotechnals when you integrate in time or? Oh, the parameterization is di well. The, the, these tensors are um, diagnosed offline. No, I understand so, that. That's but those are to be applied to coarser simulation models, right? The, the K that you are uh, deriving. Right, and, and yeah. when but we want to apply this, it's to yeah, coarser, coarser models. But but in the model itself, that you integrate Nemo, right? Oh, this is MIT BC. I'm sorry. Okay, well, the MIT yeah. GCM is it the MIT at one twelfth degree? Is it rotating the diffusion tensor? Well, at one twelfth degree resolution, we don't we have ready turned off, so there is no tensor in in these there online on on the in the online calculations. There's no eddy parameterizations implemented. Well, you have something. Well, we can talk later. You, you have to have the diffusion. Uh, well, yeah, we have a biharmonic. Yeah, biharmonic. Uh, that's not rotated. I don't believe so. And uh, it, within these on two sets of ensemble simulations, we advect passive tracers, like four, four passive tracers, in order to provide the J vector and G vector, basically, in order to solve this mean algebra problem. But so we add four passive tracers in both of these ensemble simulations and basically calculate an effective diffusion equation for the passive tracers. And uh, what comes out of trying to diagnose the Kappa tensor here or K tensor here is that for the real, what I'm showing you on the left is from the realistic ensemble and on the right is from the idealized ensemble. And what the nice thing that came out of this is that even though for the idealized ensemble, it's very, very idealized, it's a flat bottom quasi geostrophic model, like the spatial patterns that emerge for the transport coefficients or diffusivities uh, come up very similar, meaning that for the diagonal components, they tend to be positive. And um, well, so the Gulf Stream is here and the idealized jet is right in the middle. And for the anti-diagonal components, the coefficients tend to change sign across the jet, meaning like from green to purple. And also the order of magnitude comes up the same. So this is 10 to the fourth, this is also 10 to the fourth. So I guess this was, well, at least for me, unexpected that such an, like such, like a, such a similarity would emerge between the two ensemble simulations. So it's a hint to that there's some universality in how the transports are in respect to where the oceanic jet is. And then one can point, one can start examining, well, how well does this, um, how well does the ID transport tends to reconstruct the actual flux, meaning I'm now going to compare this side to the dot product of this side using the diagnosed K. So this is from the realistic ensemble. So again, I have four passive tracers, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to show one passive tracer from the realistic ensemble and two passive tracers from the UG. But so the top panel is the actual eddy flux. The bottom or the second panel is the reconstruction. I mean, there's some error, but um, it comes out pretty close to capturing, let's say, the large scale patterns. 
And this is on just one isopycnal layer. And on the bottom, I show the depth, depth profile transect along this dotted black line. So the top again is the actual eddy flux. The bottom is the reconstruction. And where you see a sharp, sick, like a large magnitude, that's where the Gulf Stream is. Basically. And again, I mean, there's some error, but the reconstruction comes up pretty good. And for the QG, the reconstruction is even better. So, well, it's like, well, this is nice. And then now, so this is for, oh yeah, five minutes, okay. So this is just for passive tracers and meaning this is only talking about the ready part. And they, well, another interest is in here, for, when I say passive, it, this captures none of the dynamical effects of the eddies. So the dynamical part, if you remember, is captured in current parameterization um, literature is captured by the GM coefficient, which is basically a parameterization for buoyancy. And one skipping some details on the math, one can um, come up with another variable, uh, which we call potential vorticity, where it incorporates buoyancy, but also momentum. And one can try to basically see if this holds using the K tensor that we diagnosed. So eddy flux of PV, uh, trying, and we try to relate it to the gradient of the mean PV dot prod with dot prod dotted by the K tensor. And uh, well, the, the, well, this is like sort of the, let's say disappointing part. But so this is what I showed the reconstruction for the surface PV. So this is the actual ID PV flux, and this is the reconstruction. For whatever reason, it seems to work to some extent for the first layer, but when you start looking into the interior, the reconstruction basically uh, resembles nothing like the actual ID PV flux. So um, I think the next, thing, yeah, do my left side. So um, what I wanted to talk here is we've introduced a relatively novel definition of eddies using the ensemble framework. And the tensor exhibits good performance in reconstructing the eddy flux of passage tracer, but not potential vorticity, which is, in my opinion, the more fun part of actually trying to parameterize the eddy dynamics. And uh, for operational purposes, the it seems that passive and active tracers have different eddy transport coefficients, meaning Papa GM and Papa Ready are not the same, which model like modeling communities tend to do. So I will finish at that. Thank you.